and I want you to make an album out of them. And I said, what is, what are, what's on the tapes? And he said, it's Jack Kerouac in a hotel room in Miami. And he just turned the tape, they turned the tape recorder on, and he just free associated into the microphone. So he said, can you do that? And I said, of course I can. You know, I've done, edited a lot of dialogue and so on. I had no idea what I was getting into. And I told Tom this story, you know, I put it together. It came out as an album called The Beat Generation. So Waits said back to me, do you know that Jack Kerouac made a record with Steve Allen? And I said, no, I didn't. I said, try to imagine these two guys together. I said, that's really an amazing thing. I, I wonder what it was like to be in the room with them when they, they did that. And Waits would often cite this album, Poetry for the Beat Generation, as his all-time favorite in early interviews. A collaboration between two very distinctive and different talents, its sound would greatly influence the young singer-songwriter. Steve Allen was a very interesting and clever guy. He was a pioneer of the American Chat Show. He was the first presenter of the Tonight program, the Tonight Show, NBC's uh, nationwide chat show. And a lot of the things he pioneered in that show are still part of the American Chat Show format today. But he was also an author, a comedian, a jazz fan, a jazz musician. He was responsible for an awful lot of black jazz musicians getting their first nationwide exposure on TV just through his own interest and his own clout at the, uh, at the station. Uh, and he was interested enough in, the, in literature in general, but beat literature in particular, to attend Jack Kerouac's uh, date at the Village Vanguard in New York and watched him more or less bomb uh, doing his readings no accompaniment, just, just Jack Kerouac uh, reading to the audience, and it wasn't quite working. So Steve Allen, probably intrigued by the whole business of spontaneous prose, he offered to accompany Kerouac on the piano while he was reading his uh, prose, adding his own spontaneous decoration to this spoken word thing. He did the second set from the piano with Kerouac, went much better, and the idea was mooted that they should make this album. The album itself is the sound of a beat poet intoning his beat prose with all its rhymes and alliterations and rhythms. And essentially it just works in and of itself. It's a kind of self-contained performance. Uh, and then next to it, in, in the adjacent space, is, is this sort of pretty jazz piano tinkling around in the, in the spaces behind and above. And there's the vague sense of words and music right. somehow interacting with each other. We'll well, a lot of people have asked me why did I write that book or any book. All the stories I wrote were true, because I believed in what I saw. I was traveling west one time at the junction of the state line of Colorado. It's arid western one and the state line of poor Utah. I saw in the clouds huge and massed above the fiery golden desert of Evenfall the great image of God with forefinger pointed straight at me. It's got a little bit of um, shtick about it. It, it. It's a bit show busy. Part of his act was he would take suggestions from the audience, pick three notes and write a song for them, just as entertainment. So there's a bit of that going on. And essentially what's going on is just musical shtick, a bit of blues, a bit of barrel house, a bit of this and a bit of that, you know. And there's, there's not really that much connection. However, having said that, the, the sound of Kerouac's heaviosity being haloed by this, this pretty jazz piano has got an atmosphere of its own. It made him think about how he could use spoken word in conjunction with musical settings, you know, and, and so that definitely led to pieces like Diamonds on My Windshield and Nighthawk Postcards and that style for him. Down the corner I'm freezing On a restless boulevard at a midnight road I'm across town from Easy Street With the tight knots of moviegoers and out-of-towners on the stroll The building's towering high above lit like dominoes or black dice Whenever there's, there's the sound of Tom Waits with spoken word plus piano, often in, in the intros to his songs, actually, where he sits and he doodles and he does this sort of cocktail-y thing. I mean, I always, I always expected Tom Waits um, 
you know, before you listen to, to him carefully, with the, you know, with his, his persona and the sound that he makes, you'd always expect something a little bit uh, heavier to come from the piano, but he's actually always surprisingly dainty and surprisingly elegant and quite, quite calm. I know. This is kind of a torch song. It was written uh, primarily for piano and fire extinguisher. And, uh... I wouldn't be surprised if he sort of picked up that from, from Alan's approach. And Alan's very clean, he's very clear, yeah. and it's, it's all very quite correct. You know, I hear that reflected sometimes in the intros to his songs in live performance, uh, particularly things like uh, Burma Shave and, and uh, Warm Beer and Cold Women. Yet although Kerouac was an influence on Waits both as a writer and through his musical work, his appeal had its limits. By the end of his life, he was a broken man, demoralized by the criticism of his post-on-the-road output and destabilized through years of alcohol abuse. He burnt bridges with some of his closest friends within the beat movement, and the media eventually lost interest in this once vital character, who in his final years would rarely step into the spotlight, only to inevitably turn up drunk. Kerouac called it the joyous disease. He knew what he was doing. He realizes he's collapsed. He realizes he's lost his power. You know, like writers like athletes have peak points. All artists have peak times when uh, the synapses in the brain are, are more fluent and connected. And Kerouac knew what his peak was. It was 51, 52, the time he was writing uh, On the Road and Visions of Cody. He knew what he was doing. In the end, his, his stomach blows up. All the capillaries begin to explode and bleed. And you can't save someone when that happens. That's beyond redemption. And on his 1976 album, Small Change, Waits confronted both the final legacy of Kerouac and his own personal demons. The track, Bad Liver and a Broken Heart in Lowell, clearly referenced both the birthplace and the final destination of Jack Kerouac, and implied that Waits had learned a further lesson from his literary hero. I think by the time Tom wrote Bad Liver and a Broken Heart, he had, to some extent, woken up to the, the reality of of Jack Kerouac's demise, you know, that the scales had fallen from his eyes a little bit and he had read enough about him and probably read Anne Charters's biography of Kerouac and um, begun to understand that the guy was uh, a tragic mess, a pitiful alcoholic wreck by the end of his life. You couldn't really ignore, you couldn't dress that up and sentimentalize that. Um, that had to be acknowledged. And I think that went in parallel with his own sort of dawning awareness of what drink was doing to him. These are early, early intimations that he himself wow. might have a problem with alcohol. I ended up with a bad liver and a broken heart. Yeah. Yeah, it drunk me a river ever since we've been apart. <laughs> 